My name is Dave Hewitt and I'm the scrum coach for the Crusaders. This session is about individual setup for all the players in the scrum. Whether you're one or eight, the same principles apply. These principles apply to all levels of the game, give you safety and also consistency as you pass through the grades. There are five key factors that go into individual setup for a scrum. First is your feet, and with your feet there need to be on the balls of your feet, the weight on the balls of your feet, the weight evenly distributed, so you've got a 50-50 split with your body weight, and either a square set a stance or a split stance depending on your position within the scrum. The next one as you move up, uh, up your body is your hips, and what I term is your duck's ass. What that is is making sure that you have a nice scoop in your back that allows you to keep your spine straight and get this, the best strength position when you're in a pushing position. The next one is your core and being tensioned. Must be a strong platform for the power from your legs to be transferred through your body and you require a strong core to do that. The fourth is chest. And with your chest it needs to be promoted and you have to try and touch your chest to your chin but not the other way around. This helps your core maintain its strength by maintaining the solidity in your upper body. The final one is your head, making sure that your head is not too upright because as you engage into a scrum, the first movement of your head is downwards and when your head goes down, your body follows. The first thing we're going to look at is their feet. So starting from the ground up, the feet are the most important part of scrummaging. You must have them both on the ground just prior to impact so you can provide the most power going forward. What we're looking for is to have the weight on the balls of our feet. And what I mean by the balls of our feet, it is in this part of our foot here. The reason for that is our weight's forward. If it's on our heels, our weight is back, and then it takes time to get out of the blocks. So when we're trying to get our weight forward, and regardless of whether you're a hooker or a lock or a prop, and you're a split stance or square stance, you've got to have it on the balls of your feet. And the way to imagine that is if you're standing on the step on the, of a ladder or the first step of a set of stairs, and you're Balls of your feet are just taking your weight and your heels are hanging in open air with nothing underneath them. And when you do that, you should be able to hold your weight about shoulder width apart with your feet for a prop and roughly about the same for a hooker, just a, a little bit narrower given you've got a prop on each side. And then from there, you should be able to squat down and come back up and still be in control. If you're on your heels, your weight's back and you can't get that credit card underneath, if you can't get that underneath, you need to make sure that you start pushing your weight forward. Okay. So what I'll get you guys just to practice, you're standing on the bottom step of a set of stairs and squat down and then come up a couple of times please. That's it. Now this time, do the same thing but put your weight back on the heels. Where's your body weight back? Exactly, it's what we don't want, the first one is where we want to be all the time. So I'll get you to go into either split stance or square stance depending on your position and just practice the weight being on the balls of your feet or your weight being on the balls of your feet and then squatting down and coming up and just to get that feeling. Split stance okay? Split stance fine, yep. That's good. When we're scrummaging, there's two types of stances depending on your position. One of them is a split stance, which is like a sprinter taking off from out of the blocks, and the other one is a square stance. The, with the, it doesn't matter which position you do, except for our props, because as long as your feet are in a square position just prior to impact, that gives you the maximum amount of pressure that you can put into the scrum. So for our props, they have to start like that, but for our hookers, our eights, our loose forwards, and our locks, who have the choice, they can start in a square stance position, in a split stance, and go to square. Or some locks prefer to start in a square stance without moving their feet at all. So just have a go at what you prefer from a stance point of view. That's good. Hookers, you need to be split allows you to release the power of the scrum. Same for our number eights, releasing the power from the back. And when we split and when we, when we have a split stance and we're engaging, it's a case of the front foot coming back, not 
the back foot coming forward because that's a lot of slower movement and a lot less powerful. Here we have an example of a hooker stance and he's using a split stance. The reason for this is a hooker has to promote his right foot. This is to allow him to promote his body, put his body weight onto this leg when he's striking for the ball when it comes in from the halfback. But also, this foot forward allows him to release the pressure of the scrum into the opposition on the engage call. His feet are also approximately shoulder width apart, slightly narrower than they would be if he was a prop, simply because he has a prop on each side that requires space as well. Here we have an example of a prop, and whether he's loose head or tight head, it doesn't really matter. The principal things we're looking for are the weight on the balls of the feet, on both feet, an even distribution of his body weight, so you've got 50%, 50%. Also, approximately shoulder width apart. This allows him to get into the lowest position he can while still being in a strong position. The reason his feet are shoulder width apart and square is that as soon as he promotes one, it turns his body and therefore makes him weaker on impact in the scrum. So working up our bodies, the next part is our hips. And with our hips, we want to get what I call the duck's ass. And the reason it's called duck's ass is because you see ducks swimming on the water and at the end where the tail is, there's a small scoop in their back. And that's sort of what we're looking for from a, a scrummaging point of view. And the way to get it is to get your hands like the old six shooters when you're kids and put them on your hips like this and when you're all set I want you to push down with your thumbs so it promotes your hips forward and it's not a push forward but it's a roll forward like that and then push down with your fingers so they roll back and down with your thumbs forward so just try that guys So down with your fingers so they roll back and down with your thumbs so they roll forward now while they're in that forward position I want you to try and bend over it's quite difficult now stand up, now roll your back, push down with your fingers, and now bend over. How much easier it is to bend over. It's part of the reason for duck's ass, but it also keeps your spine nice and straight. If you think about it from a, scrummaging, uh, from a uh, squatting point of view, when you're in the squat rack, how often do you get in there, get set, and all rolled under like this? You don't. The first thing you do when you get in there, nice and strong, and you promote your hips. So take your fingers like your six shooters put them on your hips and from there push down with your fingers so your hips go back and then down with your thumbs roll them forward then hold it there and bend over it's quite hard to bend you're bending over like a, a full stomach or a big belt that you might have on now bend down with your fingers and now bend over it allows you to get nice flat back but also allows you to bend a lot further so when you're sitting up that's quite important After our hips, we move on to our core, and the core is a vital part because it channels all the power from our legs and from the guys behind us in the scrum through us into the opposition. The core and the way to tension it is if you were standing in public and you saw somebody come up to you and look like they were going to punch you in the stomach, the first thing you do is brace, and that's what we're looking for when we're setting up at scrum time. The same principle applies if you were setting up to do a squat, you get under the bar, get set, first thing you do duck's ass, tension your core. That allows you to drive, take all the power from your legs and put it through your body and get the weight back onto the rack. The way to imagine it too is if you use Newton's cradle and what that is is if you pick the ball up at one end, let it go, it bounces the other ball off the other end. The balls in the middle are the equivalent to your core being tensioned. So just imagine someone looks like they're going to walk up to you in public and punch you in the stomach. That's the sort of tension we're looking for from your core. So if you just do that now, I'll walk around and just check to make sure that it's solid. That's good. Good stuff. Nice. That's good. That's what we're looking for for the whole time you're scrummaging, from the setup till you leave to chase the ball. So after our core, it's our chest. And what we're looking for is to promote our chest, to help the tension in our core 
and the, the power transferred through our bodies. And what we're trying to do is touch our chest to our chin, not our chin to our chest. So we want to get this, not this. Can you try that for me please Rodney? That's good. Really promoted with your chest, but also at tensions of muscles between your shoulder blades and down in the lower part of your neck. So guys, what I want you to try and do now is touch your chest to your chin while your head is in a neutral position looking into the distance. So as I walk around, push your chest out to touch your chin and I'll just test the uh, muscles in the back of your neck and between your shoulder blades. That's good. Good. Good stuff. Excellent. So the next important part is our head, because if our head's up and too elevated, it's our first movement on impact is to drop our head, and as I said before, where your head goes, your body's got to follow. So what I want you to do now is to bend, in, bend over and sit up, please. And you can see how, particularly as a hooker, the, his head is quite elevated. So if I hold him under the chin and he stands up again, it's not in a normal position, it's actually overextended. But what we're looking for is for him to be as close to this position as possible. So what I'll get you to do now is to bend over and I'll get you to look straight at this mark I've made on the ground in front of you. So straight down. And then, Rodney, if you could bend over as well, please. I'll get you to slowly lift your head until you can just see the emblem that's on his, his right chest. So just lift up and hold it there. It's almost as if you're looking over the top of a set of pair of glasses rather than through the lenses. And if I hold your neck again and you stand up, you can see that yes it's still up but it's nowhere near as elevated as it was in the previous example. What we need to do now is tie all the things we've talked about, the feet, the duck's ass, the core, the chest and the head. And what we need to do is make sure when we crouch into a set up position our body weight is forward. If our body weight's not forward and we're on our heels, it takes time on the engage call to get out, get onto the balls of our feet and engage into the opposition. So what we want to do is when we sit up, and from a, if I was a prop, my feet are square, weights on the balls of my feet, my hips, duck's ass, tension core, chest's out, and then when I bend, it's important that I bend at the hips first and then bring the knees in. Then a bit more at the hips, then knees. The reason for this is that my body weight then goes forward. If I do the same drill, but I bend at the knees first, see where my body weight goes. My body weight goes straight behind me, and all my body weight is in my backside. An easy way to know whether or not players' body weights is forward or back is to get their hands and put them on their nipples like this. And from there, if you bend at the hips first and then bring your knees in, you should end up with your hands in front of your knees. If you do the same drill, but bend at the knees first, and then bring the hips in, generally, your hands end up behind your kneecaps, and your body weight is back. So what I get you guys to do now is a prayer drill in tying our body weight and our setup with our feet, our duck's ass, our core, our chest, and our head. And when we bend over, we've got to make sure that weight's forward. So I'll get you to put your hands on your nipples like this, and I want your first movement to be at your hips and then to bring your knees in slowly after that, then your hips, then your knees, right down into your setup position. And with that, your hands should be in front of your kneecaps. So can everyone have a go at that please? That's good, everyone's in front, that's awesome. So what I get you guys to do is stand up now. This time, I want you to put your hands on your nipples again, but this time your first movement, I want to be your knees, okay? And make sure as a, you bend at your knees and then your hips. Same thing, please, guys. You can see that all players, they're slightly behind their kneecaps with their body weight now, which means all their body weight is in their backsides, therefore they'll be slower out of the scrum. Sometimes with setup, 
the players get into a good position, their body weight's forward, but they're still too upright with their, uh, with their back and the angle of their, their uh, engagement is upwards. So this time, if you could set up for me with your weight forward, bending at the hips, come right down into the set up position. And you can see here, Ash is nice and flat back, but he's still got a slight upward elevation. What we, way to correct that is to imagine we've got a broom handle through the bottom rib, and from there, he pushes an inch here, down with his chest, and up with his backside by an inch, and that flattens him out. So it's just pivoting on that broom handle. And that's a key. Rather than taking, say, two inches at this end, and nothing at this end, which drops the shoulders below the hips, you take an inch from each end, and it makes it nice and flat. What we're going to do now is combine what we've done with the feet, the hips, the core, the chest and the head and hit the machine and what that allows us to do is to make sure everything that we've talked about is actually putting into a practical application. So what we're looking for now is a prop forward. So Rodney's going to demonstrate combining everything we've talked about into engaging into the machine. And as we go, I'll correct anything that I think need fixing. So Rodney, step up. Crouch. Touch, pause, engage. Good. One more, please, Rodney. So crouch, touch, pause, engage. Good, that's spot on. Nice and flat through your back. So crouch, touch, pause, engage. Good hit, that's it. Luke's going to demonstrate a lock setup. He's going to start with a split stance, so his feet will be split, but on impact, or just prior to, his foot that's forward will be back on the ground, so when he engages, he's got both feet on the ground and he's pushing on an, off an even platform. So Luke. So crouch. Touch. Pause. Engage. So crouch. Touch. Pause, engage. That's it, good. So crouch, touch, pause, engage. Good, spot on. We're looking at a hooker, and again, a hooker has a split stance. So when he pulls his right foot back to, be, to engage into the scrum, making sure that it's on the ground just before impact. So we'll set up again, please Will. Crouch. Touch. Pause. Engage. Good, that's it. So crouch. Touch. Pause. Engage. Spot on. Crouch. Touch. Pause. Engage. When we get into a perfect pushing position for all um, positions, regardless of whether you're front row or locks or loose boards, we're looking for about a 120 angle here at the knee. We're looking for a similar degree here, a nice flat back through the hips to the shoulders. Also, which is a bit hard to see, we're looking to make sure that our feet are shoulder width apart. If you get those on impact, you're in the strongest position you can be from a biomechanical position. What we're going to look at now is some core activation drills which give a good indication of the core strength of the individuals in the scrum. So what we'll do now, we have two players. Rodney here will go down on his knees. Will will lean forward and Rodney will take his body weight, making sure that he maintains a solid plank through here so not, his hips aren't back or too far forward. From here, Rodney will take either his left hand or his right hand off Will's chest, alternating for an up to 10 and then what uh, Will has to do is make sure he doesn't rotate and the less he rotates indicates the stronger his core is. So Rodney if you could start please. That's good. 
Nice, keep that nice and solid. Excellent. Good stuff. That's it, come up boys please. The next stage for this core activation drill is to take the hands from the chest of the individual out to his biceps. This puts a little bit more rotation on the person who's doing the exercise and makes sure that their core is strong enough to scrummage. Boys. Make it maintaining nice and solid through here. And 10 times please Will. This is a lot harder because there's a lot more rotational force going through. Nice and solid Rodney, good. That's great. Keep fuck, keep that engaged. That side. That's it. Good. The key for this drill is making sure the core strength is up to the level you need to scrummage. And an indicator with this is it shows how much you rotate. Shows shows that you need to do a little bit more work on keeping your core up to the level you need in order to scrummage. Another core activation drill that we have is these boys will go into a one-on-one -on -one scrummaging position. And from there, once they're set, I will just put a little bit of tension on each of them to simulate what happens in a scrum where you have forces coming from angles that you're unaware of. Just go down and get set up, guys. So they get into a perfect scrummaging position, binds up, and from there, I just add a little bit of pressure in opposing angles. When the players are in this position, you do it for 20 to 30 seconds for about two to three times, just depending on the skill level and the strength level of, of the uh, players involved. This drill here is about reinforcing the technique that we talked about from the feet, the hips, the core and the chest, and also that we did on the machine. What will players do here is they're on their knees, they lean in and get into a good pushing position. From there, working together, they try and stand up or lift themselves up into a perfect pushing position. Boys, can you give us a demonstration, please? It's really key that when players work together here and we maintain a nice flat pat platform between our hips and our shoulders. This is a, uh, the next step from the uh, drill where they come up, players come off their knees. What we do here is we get the players into a perfect pushing position. They bind up, they work together, and they lower themselves down so the knees are almost touching the ground, then up again, and they do that three times. All the time, they're working together to maintain that their backs and their hips are flat, just like a tabletop. What we don't want to see is players' shoulders dropping or the hips pushing forward and coming up. We want to maintain a nice, flat platform. So it binds up, when you're ready, and up, that's it, and up, and down, and up, good. The exercise we're going to start now is the sink extend catch up drill and what this does is simulates scrummaging for an individual and what one person does is provides resistance to about 60 to 80 percent and the other person works on all the things we've discussed their feet their hips their core their chest but also maintaining their pressure going forward and then once the person is pushed back three to five meters change roles It's key that the pressure goes straight through, not upward. That's good. Break. You ready? Good. Hop. Reset. Don't hop, just extend. Okay. The thing to remember with this drill is the person who's providing the resistance may not be in good pushing position. They are there to provide something for the person to push against 
and with going backwards they will get out of position. This next drill is a continuation of their sink, extend, catch up and when players become more competent and their ability increases from a scrummaging point of view what we do is we increase the resistance that they push against. So here we've got three players, two of the players will be providing resistance and one will be doing the sink, extend, catch up activity. The key here is that the two players, yes they're providing resistance but they're not providing so much that the player can't go forward. Boys could you set that up please? So when you're ready Rodney, that's good, making sure that Rodney's chest stays close to the ground and doesn't ride up like he's pulling a wheelie. That's it. The key to all this is forming habits. And the way you form a habit is by practice and practice and practice. But we make sure we practice the correct technique. If you don't practice the correct technique, then all you're doing is reinforcing a bad habit. All the guys who have been scrummaging and guys who are learning to scrummage do it a certain way because they think that's the right way. But reality is, in most cases, what they're doing is incorrect from a technique point of view and they're just ingraining a bad habit. The key to this is making sure that when your guys practice, they're reinforcing the correct technique, thereby reinforcing a positive habit. So when they get tired, that's what they go back to at scrum time. Just remember, the correct technique is safe technique. Have fun with your coaching.